mentioned if they don't set the reserve price, the, uh, the buyer would pay zero? Yeah, so imagine there's only one person who's bidding, right, in the auction, for example. Then the buyer would pay, right, zero. Or imagine there were two people bidding, but one person only values it at like a dollar, and the other person values it at a hundred dollars. Then, in the absence of a reserve price, the person who values it at a hundred dollars would end up paying one dollar, because they just beat the other guy, right? Whereas if you set a reserve price of 70, then the guy who is valued at 100 will pay 70, right? So there's this trade-off between probability of sale and the price that you get, which is exactly like a monopolist would have. Um, okay. So uh, Laurent Ainov and his co-authors um, studied this with eBay data. So what they did is they said, okay, we're economists, we could go and we could be like John List and we could run a bunch of experiments. Or we could be even more creative. We could let other people run experiments and then we could just look at it, right? So what he, they did is they found at least um, 500,000 occasions on eBay at which the same seller had sold the identical object um, at different terms at least 15 different times, right? So this is just going on all the time. So why should we have to run the experiments ourselves? Let's let everybody else run them and we'll just observe the experiments being run, right? And they used these to do a bunch of things, but one thing they did was to draw out auction demand curves. What's an auction demand curve? Well, it's what exactly what we were just talking about. They looked when they said different reserve prices, what was the relationship between the induced probabilities of sale and average prices? Um, and they got in a very interesting curve because they got that actually the marginal revenue curve was increasing in certain parts. So I showed you a bunch of marginal revenue curves that were all decreasing. But if it gets convex enough, the demand curve, then you can actually get a non-monotone marginal revenue curve where it decreases in some parts but then increases in others. Um, and this, so I'll show you the picture. They found that for objects that had different values in terms of like, you know, the book or book value or what that object typically sells for, um, they had, you know, different sorts of demand curves a little bit, but they all basically had the same shape if you normalize for the value of the object. And that was this extremely convex shape. So what I did was I fit a third degree polynomial to this thing. I basically found out what was the, you know, the way that you, you fit a line. Rather than fitting a line, I fit a curve to it, right? And this was what the curve sort of looks like. You see it fits pretty well through these demand curves. And then you could draw out the marginal revenue curve associated with that. And look, it has this weird shape. It goes down, and then it comes back up again, and then it goes down again. So the problem that that creates is imagine that the value to you of keeping the object is like, I don't know, 0.7 of the value or 0.8 of the value, right? <laughs> then that's going to intersect this marginal revenue curve three times. Which one of those is the right price for you to set? Well, we can sort of think about this in the same terms that we thought about what happened when there was multiple intersections between price and marginal cost, right? What do people think? If, if my value for keeping the object was here, what price do you think I'd want to set? Would it be the price over here, or would it be the price over here? How many people think to the right? All the way to the right. Raise your hand. So you're selling the good. Yeah, I'm selling the good. I'm the auctioneer. And I can set any reserve price, a reserve price that induces an average uh, probability of sale over here or one that induces one over here, right? Um, if my like, cost of sales, that is like how much I value keeping the good, is here, what would I set as my uh, reserve price? Uh, the part all the way to the right, the one in the middle, or the one over here? How many people think the one all the way to the right? Raise your hand. Three people. How many people think the one in the middle? Two people. Three people. How many people think the one all the way to the left? couple people. So people are obviously totally confused. It's the one to the right. Why is that? The profit 
that I earn is the area between the marginal revenue curve and my cost. So if it's down here and I set the price over here, then I get, I miss out on the opportunity to make these extra profits here, right? But I avoid losing these profits over here. Sorry. Oh, no, no, I get losses here. But then I could gain all these profits over here. These profits are bigger than these losses are, if it's at, you know, right here. And so I'd clearly want to produce over here. That's by the same sort of logic we did with the marginal cost curves and the price. Yeah, Jacob. I get the same, the, the same idea. I'm confused why we're moving left to right here. Because moving right to left is as you increase the reserve price. So I picked the middle one because I thought. Yeah, but this is marginal revenue as a function of the probability that you sell, right? right? As a, as, as yeah, go ahead, Ned. I'm sorry, I, I just still don't understand why you need a third degree polynomial to fit to those points. To fit to these curves? Yeah, they look, honestly, they just look falling. What? Maybe I'm not. Well, they are, but they're convex. They're not linear. I mean, they're not falling like that. And we need to know the curvature of them in order to figure out what the shape of the marginal revenue curve is, right? I mean, we could do it with a quadratic, but it wouldn't really fit very well. It, they're not really quadratic. The quadratic couldn't capture the fact that it flattens out all of a sudden here. Well, that doesn't fit well either. I mean, if you just try doing it, it doesn't work. I mean, this is too convex to do that, basically. Um, yeah, go ahead. Aren't you presupposing that those two areas are equivalent, though? Um, like, between the purple line and the black line? Ah, we, well, I was about to go through that. Um, OK, so then um, why would we never produce here? This is the worst possible point, right? Because then I get these losses and I avoid these gains. So that's the worst possible point. OK, now what about if my price, what if my, my reservation value, how much I value keeping the object, were up here? Which price would I choose? How many people think to the left? Raise your hand. So you're moving the black line up? Yeah, yeah. I'm, now I'm moving the line to here. How many people think to the right? No one. How many people think in the middle? Like here, nobody. OK, good. Now people are getting the idea. Because over here, I avoid taking all these losses down here. And I would only get, if I move to the right, these little gains up here. OK. Now, yeah, go ahead, Charlie. So what about the, like how big of a factor of the probability of sale in terms of wanting to get rid of this item? How big of a factor is it? Well, it depends on how much you value keeping the object. You know, if you, value, if you value keeping the object a lot, then you don't really, you're not that excited to sell unless you get a really high price. If, if you really put no value on the object, well, then you're willing to sell at almost any price, right? And you're just trying to maximize the amount that you get out of the auction. Yeah, go ahead, Joe. Um, what would be a potential explanation for why the marginal revenue would increase as the probability of sale? Well, the reason that John and Laurent and these, these guys who wrote this paper said, was that basically, if you try to sell with pro like a very high probability, like sort of, there's, there's only a certain chance that you get someone who really has a lot of value for this object, right? And sort of beyond, if you want to sell it with like a probability higher than that, you're going to get a bunch of people who are just going to like go and resell it themselves on eBay, right? So there's like only a certain, like all this, part of the demand curve up here is sort of like people who actually are going to keep the object. And then these guys down here are sort of people who are just going to go resell it because they got a special deal. So you basically either have to say, OK, I'm desperate. I'm just going to sell it at sort of whatever price it can resell at. And that gets me over here, right? Or I got to try to actually you know, make the sale to someone who's going to keep the thing. And then we get this demand curve over here. And that's why you get this very convex shape and that gets you this non-monotone marginal revenue curve. Your probability of sale by decreasing your reservation? Or 
Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, go ahead, Connor. Is that related to the assumption that there's like a bimodal distribution of Yeah, e exactly. So, I mean, th this isn't literally bimodal here, but it's extremely closely related to that. You basically only in the real world get this shape when you have a bimodal distribution of valuations. Yeah. And anytime you have unimodal, you get declining marginal revenue and vice versa. They're almost, it's actually an interesting mathematical <laughs> problem that I don't think anyone has solved, but if you wanted to do it, it would be a really nice paper to actually, it turns out it's, it, there's not, unimodality doesn't really work because if you had a like uniform distribution with tiny little bumps in it, that would still have declining marginal revenue. So you can't exactly get an equivalence between these things. But anytime you have like a nice unimodal distribution, you always get declining marginal revenue. Anytime you have like a really bad multi bimodal distribution, you always get the opposite. So the question is, what additional assumptions can you add to establish an equivalence between these things? And that was actually a really nice mathematical problem that I, that I don't think anyone's ever solved. But if you want to talk to me about that, it's an, it would be a nice paper. Um, OK. Anyway, so the point here is that if your marginal, if your you know, reservation value goes from just below this to just above it, the price is going to jump from down here to all the way up there, right? And um, because you move from being wanting to charge over here to being to want to charge over here, right? And so what is the point at which you do that? Well, it's the, when the area underneath and above is the same, right? And we call that the ironing line. Because we can just draw this line here and then chop off the part below and the part above and treat that as if that's the marginal revenue curve. Right? And that's just as we ironed the marginal cost before, you can iron this marginal revenue here. OK. So why is monopoly inefficient? Well, monopoly has two basic effects relative to competition. On the one hand, raising prices transfers resources to the monopolist from the consumers. right? because they get a higher price, the consumers have to pay a higher price. But on the other hand, it's going to reduce how many, people are how many people are going to purchase the good, because now they have to pay a higher price. Um, and the question is, uh, Jackson? Where's Jackson? Yeah. Uh, yeah, Jackson. How do we know that this is inefficient? Yeah, so in particular, they would have been willing to pay for the good as much as it costs to produce it, but not as much as the prices. And those people are going to get priced out of the market, and that's inefficient because there would have been a social gain to doing that. Um, uh, so actually, there's a nice uh, article in The Economist this week that I just heard this morning that uh, in the, does anyone read The Economist here? In the China section, there's a, Banyan article that's about like the monopoly problem in China, and it like goes through exactly this logic. Uh, so, um, okay. So the in, these sort of inefficiencies in monopoly appear in real life very often. This it, there was an example in China of this uh, where uh, Milton Friedman was. What was exactly the example they were giving? all sorts of like sales that didn't go on in like the telecom sector because prices were basically too high even though you could have afforded to serve those people for very little. Um, but you know, there's lots of other examples that are more uh, familiar to our everyday lives like you know, music doesn't cost anything. Like it doesn't cost me anything if, uh, if Israel listens to some song that I own, right? And um, so you would think that those things should be freely available, but they're not, right? Um, and uh, that's a social loss, right? Another great example of this is, I don't know if you've ever experienced like, that people are constantly roaming around the streets of a city looking for 